excuse me, in which Mr. Pinak Simal will defend his academic thesis, development of micro-engineered systems to initiate, analyze, and control stem cell patterning. Uh, my name is Nana de Vries. I'm the Vice Dean for the Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences, and I'm chairing this session. Um, there will be an opposition, but before we start the actual opposition, uh, Mr. Simal, I would like to invite you to give a summary of your work. The floor is yours. Uh, dear Prorector, uh, dear members of the Corona, family, friends, and audience. In the next 15 minutes, I will briefly summarize the work which I performed during my PhD candidature, resulting in the thesis entitled Development of Microengineer Systems to Initiate, Analyze, and Control Stem Cell Patterning. Now, uh, patterning can either be natural or artificial. We come across patterns every day in our life, for example, during visual perception. Uh, in this slide, we see a simple pattern of blue tiles above the red line and yellow tiles below the red line. And such combinations of simple patterns, of course, can give rise to intricate structures, for example, art forms. Now, the same is true in case of biology. Uh, in, in this case, a uh, pattern could be defined as uh, cells being at the right place at the right time and doing the right function. Uh, now, these tissue patterns give rise to organs during embryonic development. Suppose we wanted to make organs in the lab, you would of course say, okay, let's, let's take these cells and see how they develop into a whole organism. And then we can gain knowledge about this tissue patterning process. However, it's not so easy to study a developing organism, mainly because of technical as well as ethical reasons. Uh, fortunately, over the past uh, few years, uh, stem cell models have been developed. Uh, which actually closely mimic the development of actual embryo. So on the left here, you see uh, the development of actual embryo over a few days. And on the right, you see stem cell aggregates, which in the lab can be coaxed to, uh, to form similar features over a period of few, few days. And this happens in 3D. Uh, the same can be done in 2D, where the stem cells are seeded on a flat uh, surface. Uh, there is cell material interaction. And these stem cells then self-organize and form uh, the different germ layers and differentiate. And this can uh, mimic a, a developing embryo of a, a cross-section of a developing embryo, which you can see on the left. <clears throat> so several such models have been developed in the last few years. For example, organoids, there is pre-gastulation as well as post-gastulation patterning, as well as neural tube formation models. Uh, now, one thing you could ask is how do the cells know how to do this? I mean, you put them in a, in a flask or a culture tissue uh, plate, and they somehow know where to go and what to do. Uh, and to, to know this, I, I believe that we need new tools. And these tools could be, for example, microengineer tools. Uh, so in my thesis, I described the development and application of uh, different devices using these tools. Uh, I believe that application of, for example, microfluidics, uh, synthetic metrics, and surface topography could help us to uh, decipher how this uh, patterning processes take place. And this can help us in turn in controlling organogenesis in vitro, which in the future can help in facilitating regenerative medicine by creating and designing uh, better organs. So in the work described in the thesis, we start in some of the chapters uh, with the free floating uh, single cell suspension of pluripotent stem cells. We let them aggregate together and over a period of time, uh, this aggregate grows in size. Now you would uh, assume that uh, this aggregate will continue to grow in all the directions, uh, but this does not happen. And what happens is the aggregate breaks symmetry. So one end of the aggregate starts behaving differently than the other. This is, fol uh, this is followed by polarization. So uh, polarized expression of genes. And, and if you let the aggregates grow further, they elongate even higher of a higher degree. Uh, and this whole process takes a few days and uh, it can be done using, for example, P19C5 cell lines or mouse embryonic stem cells. Now, uh, uh, of course, uh, a main question is how does this elongation occur? Is it because uh, cells migrate from one end to the other end? Or is it that the cells in one end of the aggregate differentiate? Or is it a combination of both? And how do we analyze this? 
so one of the ways which this could be done is looking inside the aggregate. Uh, there are multiple ways to do this, uh, but one of the ways which we followed was using cell tracking using 3D live cell microscopy. So what you essentially do in this case is you take the aggregate, you perform optical sectioning of the aggregate in live tissue, of course, and then follow this over time. And then you analyze the data to track back how the cells move within the aggregate. But this can be easier said than done because there are multiple challenges which are associated with cell tracking. So the cells we use, uh, embryonic stem cells, they are highly uh, photolabile and they can show high degree of phototoxicity. Uh, the images which we obtain must be clear in order for us to track the cells. Uh, we need computational pipelines, which we can use to track the cells. And once the, uh, when, once the aggregate is elongating, uh, we need to make sure that it doesn't move around and it's locked into position so that we can track the cells within the aggregate. So to achieve this, we use thin film microcavities and each of the microcavities were designed to hold one aggregate. And the advantage of using these thin film microcavities is that we could use low working distance objectives. Uh, and this in turn facilitated high resolution microscopy. We designed elongated microcavities and the idea was that these elongated microcavities could hold uh, the, the stem cell aggregates. And over time, the aggregates polarize and they elongate and they are locked into position due to the shape of the microcavity. So for uh, making these microcavities, we used a process called microthermoforming, where you essentially take a thin polymer film and under elevated pressure and temperature, you extrude it biaxially within a metal mold. And the, the film basically takes the, the shape of the mold. Uh, so we designed micro we designed and fabricated microcavities of uh, different dimensions, leading from very low degree of uh, elongation as shown here to a very high degree of elongation. And uh, what we found was that we could culture the aggregates within the microcavities, as shown here in this uh, time lapse video. We were able to visualize single cell migration towards one end of the, of the aggregate, and we were actually then able to quantify how the cells move. Uh, and when we performed this across several different aggregates, we found that the data was robust and reproducible. In the end, we found that there was an interplay between localized differentiation and localized cell migration, which led, led to elongation within these uh, stem cell aggregates. Uh, during, the, during the process of this study, uh, what we realized is we also took a lot of bright field images. Uh, and as you can see, an example is shown here where there is cell, but we also saw a, saw a large degree of background. Now, in order to quantify the cells, this background could be could hamper the process of quantification. Um, the way we perceive things is we look at an object, we distinguish the object, we remove the background, and we look at the object of interest. To, to adapt this process uh, or something similar in this physical world, we actually use fluorinated polymer microcavities or FAP microcavity. And the interesting thing about these microcavities is that when they are in contact with cell culture medium or when they are imaged in cell culture medium, they become optically clear. So then you can easily visualize your aggregate or your sample of interest by removing the background. However, challenging, uh, however, FEP uh, microstructuring is considered to be quite challenging. We therefore had to uh, optimize the process quite a bit, but in the end, we were able to uh, achieve micro cavities with 800 micrometer uh, diameter. Uh, and uh, when compared with polycarbonate microcavities, which were, which were used early in the earlier studies, we saw significantly reduced background. We applied these microcavities uh, for culturing these mouse embryonic stem cell aggregates, and we were able to extract data automatically using a custom machine learning based pipeline, uh, both from bright field images as well as from fluorescent images. Uh, we also did a proof of study where we exposed the aggregates to a small molecule, lentinculin A which is an actin inhibitor and showed, the, showed that these uh, cavities could be useful in, for example, drug screening. Uh, now we come to 2D patterning. Uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, cells in uh, planar surfaces could undergo self-organization. So we decided to optimize techniques which we could use to microstructure substrates in 2D, which could be used to influence patterning processes. For this, we utilized a process of uh, DPV lithography in the process, uh, a substrate is basically exposed to deep UV irradiation uh, using a photomask. 
uh, upon exposure to deep uv radiation this leads to change season within the substrate uh, the the exposed area is then developed and chemically etched and this leads to the development of a final microstructure as shown here we applied this process and optimized this process for uh, for a popular thermoplastic which is widely used called pmma uh, we took thick pmma uh, sheets and these were exposed uh, using a chromium quartz mask uh, to a deep uv source and uh, for example here we show some test structures and we are able to obtain features uh, as low as 1 micrometer in size uh, we did uh, next what we did is we we did this with different uh, microstructures and for example using uh, pmma with micro channels we used it as a master to actually fabricate chips in uh, pdms and these PDMS chips were used as microfluidic uh, artificial signaling centers. Now in a developing embryo, uh, the head to tail patterning takes place uh, using wind activator and inhibitor gradients. And we decided to see if we could uh, achieve this, for example, such gradient formation uh, in vitro. So we use the chip, we put cells which were uh, reported for wind pathway. And as, sh as shown in the result, we were able to achieve a gradient of signal starting from the wind activator region to the wind inhibitor region. Um, so, so far so good, but you would ask, well, in the beginning I mentioned that there are new tool, uh, tools needed and with these tools need to be applied to these in vitro models. Uh, but for example, uh, the development of let's say PMMA could be, you could consider it to be a bit too out of reach for general biomedical community. Maybe there is the need for specialized uh, UV source or specialized uh, substrate. So we then decided to go back to the lab and think, okay, uh, what is there in the biomedical lab and what is the most widely used substrate? And that is the cell culture plate, of course, which is made of polystyrene. So we decided, okay, can we do this process in polystyrene so that it can be easily adapted and used in biomedical laboratories? So we started with a tissue culture well plate made of polystyrene. And uh, using this new method, we just put a, a chromium quartz into the polystyrene well plate. We expose it to a deep UV source. And we developed uh, the polystyrene using a combination of uh, xylene and IPA, both of which were chosen because they are widely available in tissue culture laboratories and biomedical laboratories. And this led to the generation of microstructures. These microstructures were used to uh, control cell patterning, for example, in this case, neurons from PC12 aggregates. Uh, and as you can see on the, on the image below in the timeless movie, the neurons actually followed uh, the contact guidance within the, the microgroups. Now, now you could ask, okay, well, you use polystyrene substrate, uh, but let's say chromium quartz mask is uh, maybe not accessible. Uh, let's say a specialized UPV source is not accessible. So how is it this adaptable to a biomedical laboratory? So to further simplify this process and to make a process such that you could get into the lab within an hour, select your pattern, print it, and then do the whole process in the lab itself, we optimize the process and simplify the process. So we use the same uh, polystyrene well plate as shown. We use a com uh, commercially available deep uv exposure device which is widely available nowadays for sterilization of mobile phones and use in household instead of a chromium quartz mask we now use a printer based mask so you can literally print your uh, your mask sort of in paper and for all this process we use the same uh, developer so uh, how would this process work well you start with uh, the image of your choice in this case i will again go back to mona lisa um, you just download the image uh, using freely available uh, stencil making tools online, you convert it into a stencil. You can uh, resize it to a size of your choice and you print it onto a normal paper. You then transfer uh, the, the ink or the toner onto a polystyrene substrate. You expose it to deep UV. And after development, you, are, you end up with structures uh, and, based, uh, and you can modulate the height of the structures of course with this process. So uh, we believe that this new, newly optimized and developed process uh, gives biomedical uh, scientists a new tool which, they, which can be used to control stem cell patterning uh, in vitro. With this, I would like to uh, finally end. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my supervisors, uh, so Roman and Stefan, and also the members of the assessment as well as the defense committee 
And of course, uh, no work is uh, completely done in isolation. So uh, I would like to also thank Merlin, the Bios team, GT Lab, and of course the university. And on the left, uh, all the softwares which are free and open access, which I use throughout the the project. Uh, thank you, and I give the floor back to the prorector. Yes, thank you. Uh, it is a bit early to thank the defense committee, but uh, we'll see. Maybe after the ceremony and all the questions, uh, you will be able to thank them again. Uh, but now we turn to the actual opposition. And the first question will be asked by the chair of the assessment committee, who is also the secretary of this degree committee, and that's Professor Frank Grinsen. And he is a professor of regenerative medicine in the Merlin Institute at our university. Professor Frank Grinsen. Thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, uh, I first want to congratulate you with a really very nice studies and an excellent thesis. Uh, I want to extend my congratulations also to the, the two supervisors, uh, Dr. Giesebrecht and Professor Truckenmüller. Um, having read your thesis and also now heard your, your nice uh, presentation, I would like to go into the um, chapter four, where you uh, have a kind of a membrane over it yes. for delivery of compounds. Yes. In chapter three, you already showed you have like a wind inhibitor and activator on both sides with gradient. Uh, with your uh, device in chapter four, do you think it's possible to have like also like a membrane underneath it and to make a gradient or make polarity in cells, especially if you think of, for instance, gut cells uh, or also the neuro cells do it have a polarity? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you. For the kind words and for the for the question, uh, I assume uh, you mean so the the membranes which we showed was of course in the PMMA substrate, and I assume uh, you mean that if it is possible with the polystyrene substrate, uh, right? Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, yes, indeed, I would uh, assume that it is possible. Uh, we did not do uh, active flow studies, uh, but uh, as you could see that we could fabricate this uh, micro channels or grooves. And you could, in theory, place a polycarbonate membrane on top of it and then expose, for example, one part of the aggregate or let's say a, a cluster of cells uh, to a particular pathway. You could even modulate, for example, you could have three or four different gradients. Uh, for example, neural, neural tube morphogenesis, you have different gradients of different factors and then modulate this indeed. Uh, and you could even do it. The advantage of uh, using a polystyrene substrate is that you could use a polystyrene membrane itself. Uh, that makes also the bonding easier. So you make a polystyrene, well, porous membrane, bond it on a poly polystyrene plate, and you have a whole polystyrene system, basically, uh, in the material which is widely used, basically, in cell culture. Very nice. When we stay a little bit with the channels you are also now describing, um, in, in your thesis, you had always like the same uh, diameter of channel, the depth of the channel, uh, although you showed that you can make it in different sizes. Uh, how would you go for it when you, for instance, want to make a vascular structure where you typically have like a, a broad uh, vessel that goes narrower and then again broad again, like from artery to, to venous structure? Uh, how can you imagine to perhaps do that in your system? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. So the you would say that the structures which I showed, of course, were more or less one size, of course, so, uh, either this diameter or this diameter. But uh, the power of uh, using photo mass is that you could use, in theory, any dimension which is coming down or increasing, and then this would follow your design. So uh, the resolution limit is approximately 300 nanometers. So in theory, you could go to mill from millimeter scale, bring it down, 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 up to, for example, micrometer scale. Uh, the only um, only thing which I can think of is because you you change the the size of the micro channel, you would also change how much uh, exposure your channel gets. So mm -hmm. what you maybe end up with uh, is uh, deeper parts at the wider channels and uh, narrower parts at the at the smaller channels. Uh, but this could also be circumvented. For example, you could use uh, well sequential exposure. So first you make wider channels and then you have three or four mass and then you make another channel which is slightly narrower and then continue to, to get this. Yeah, this could be designed. It sounds very interesting. 
Um, when you then also look at that, you also described uh, your microfluidic flow, how that indeed uh, uh, yeah, put it to the cells and made a differentiation in the cells. So when you make, for instance, this, what we just discussed, the nice from bro to small, you also would expect there's a difference in microfluidic flow. Um, you also showed nicely that the microfluidic flow indeed makes differentiation. Are there, do you, can you envision to have uh, differences in microfluidic flow to induce different differentiations or even a temporal different uh, stimulation of your cells? Yes, um, so uh, when, when dealing with microfluidic flow, there are two things to consider. Uh, one thing could be if the, the cells are in direct contact, let's say, you, let's, say, let's take the example of the vasculature, right? So if, if let's say the cells are within the, the channels and you flow, uh, the flow rate has to be controlled to ensure that uh, the cells do not uh, have shear stress, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, endothelial cells, I think, uh, yeah, endothelial cells have been shown that under shear stress, they elongate and they orient towards one direction. And also other cells have been known to differentiate, for example. Uh, so by controlling the flow, uh, you could actually control how the cells behave, first of all. Second of all, you could have, so you, in theory, you could have one uh, broader sink and a source, and you could have this vasculature basically in between or channels. And on one side, you could flow, um, uh, let's say, reagent which induces or attracts uh, these cells. And one side, you could, in theory, flow something which inhibits the cell. And you could then measure if the cells actually move towards one side and uh, form polar, polarized structures or not. Can you, can you also imagine that you can have like different differentiations, like uh, think for instance of, of, uh, of a bone tissue or of other tissue where you, have, where you have vessels and you have the other sites where different types of flow or different types of mechanical stress are necessary? Uh, within the same chip, yes. Uh, so in, for example, in PDMS chips, this is often done by using a system called uh, the Christmas tree system where you actually have a channel which divides and keeps dividing and you could start with one concentration of reagent but each of your let's say segment or part of the chip is then in the end exposed to controlled different concentration so you could start with uh, let's say seeding uh, one type of cells or stem cell in uh, the channels but due to this gradient you would see one part one segment becomes let's say procury or mesoderm or bone and the other segments becomes other type cell type, and you could nicely have a higher throughput, let's say, differentiation study like this. Very nice. That, that brings me actually to one of my last questions, which is about chapter five, where you showed nicely that your PC12 spheroids, you have nice outgrowth and so on, but you did still use like NGF in their horse serum to stimulate it. Do you think that is necessary from the beginning or? If it is necessary from the beginning, may it be that at a certain moment it is enough to have your cells, to your, that uh, you have your your microfluidic device, you have your topography, that that is enough to keep it in a differentiated state. Uh, now there have been multiple studies uh, which have shown that actually you could uh, you could put cells on a, for example, microstructure substrate, and these microstructure substrates, for example, could uh, simulate the cells to differentiate and to maintain differentiation. In our case with PC12 study, uh, we did not do this. And the main reasoning was that we actually wanted to see if at all under controlled conditions, uh, the, the microstructures would actually orient the cells, let's say. Uh, so this was the first step, of course. Now the next step would be to see if actually these structures sub, uh, support differentiation without any external factors. Uh, but since initially we didn't even know if we, would, we could influence the cells at all, we decided to go with a more control, let's say, experiment. Uh, but indeed, uh, using microstructuring of substrates is definitely possible to, uh, to control uh, cell state. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm satisfied with your answers and I'm giving back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pokinson. And I'm now turn to a guest in his opposition, a guest from abroad. We're always very happy to see those guests uh, contributing. Uh, because it attests to the importance of the work and also to this ceremony, of course. Um, and um, Professor Gallio was already a member of the assessment committee and now he is also here. So um, Professor Parsi Gallio is a 
Professor of Micro and Nano Systems Research at the University of Tampere, Finland. Thank you for being here and your question, please. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Pro Rector, dear candidate. I would like to start the discussion with, uh, with a new method that you developed for PMMA uh, and polycarbonate bonding. I think it was uh, chapter four. Uh, and you used the aptus together with, with UV. So how did you end up uh, with, with uh, using aptus in this study? So what was behind that idea? Yes, uh, so we initially actually tried to do just thermal bonding of the substrates of, uh, of polycarbonate and uh, of PMMA. Uh, but the, the temperature required for bonding, uh, when we were able to sufficiently bond them, we realized that the, the chips were, let's say, uh, the structures were deformed. And so we wanted to do a, a sort of bonding where we use lower uh, temperature. So of course, as you read that we use DPUV uh, flat exposure and then we, this reduced the molecular weight and in turn the transition temperature of the surface. But we also realized that uh, in multiple papers, uh, aptest was used, especially for bonding thermoplastic polymers because apparently it uh, functionalizes the surface. It induces a, a, a group, I think it's NH group. And this uh, you can use to actually bond the two thermoplastics together especially when the thermoplastics are not similar, for example, PC and PMMA. Uh, so in order to ensure that the bonding works, so we also use aptis uh, in this case, yeah, for low temperature bonding. Okay, thank you. And uh, that was actually my follow-up question to this, that so in the thesis, you didn't describe the mechanism of aptis. Uh, so it was left a little bit open. So how did it actually work and why? Why does it uh, improve the bonding uh, capability? Yeah, so you know, when you use aptis, uh, the, the solution basically bonds to onto the, uh, in this case, let's say polycarbonate or the interface, right? So uh, a polymer or material, it causes, from what I remember, it causes these uh, groups to be formed above. These groups uh, then enable covalent linking with the other polymer. And so the, the main, the way of bonding is actually covalent linkage basically between the two different polymer uh, interfaces. Yeah, and, and I, this is a <clears throat> one example where you, I think in, in, the, in, in the thesis, you had very nice uh, progress in, in microfabrication. And this is one example when, uh, when you microfabricate uh, uh, those membranes and parts. But then you also, when you make a functional device, you need to put them together. You need yeah. uh, some kind of assembly. And I think also this assembly was, uh, not so much discussed, but what, what are the challenges when, when do you make the final devices from, from the microfabricated pieces? And in your thesis, what were the yields, like yes. uh, per, uh, and numbers uh, of, 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 of chips that you made? Yes, uh, so when we started with PMMA, uh, as you would imagine that uh, we, we did a DPV exposure and then we did the development, but the development step was 24 hours in uh, time. So it was relatively long and we, we use only one DPUV source. So that meant with a, we did not have cut mass. So we had a single mask. So you could do one, well, we could do two chips at a time and we could use them to develop. So realistically speaking, I would say we could make six chips uh, per day of PMMA. But of course, this is more of practical limitation. You, you could say, okay, I can cut the mask and I can make 50 chips as well if you have cut mass. Uh, but uh, then comes the process of bonding because uh, you, we made the chips with the micro channels then we bonded with polycarbonate and then we tested the flow. So this was done using, for example, the dye. Uh, and when we did this, the yield was more than 50%, I would say about uh, 60, 50 to 60%. Uh, there were occasional uh, limitations. So occasionally some channels, uh, we do, would not flow. So for example, either due to membrane sagging or they were blocked. Um, but uh, we did obtain a good enough yield. However, of course, as you can imagine, it takes time to get that 50%. And uh, then when you put cells, it's another different story because then you need even higher yields, of course. Yeah. And how, how many devices did you make during your study? Like uh -huh. roughly? For for PMMA, uh, you mean? Uh, for example, in this in, in for, for the, this device, yes, where you have uh, the microfluidic. I would say so. The initial uh, idea was we didn't use cells initially, so it was just flow characterization, and there we use uh, made at least 
50 to 100, I would say, uh, mm. uh, channels. Because uh, we also tested, I would have to add that we tested different channels and different dimensions and different uh, structures as well. So at least 100, I would say, yeah. would be my... Yeah. And now you have uh, four very nice devices which you have developed for different uh, biological purposes, uh, different applications. Uh, if you would now get uh, a request from a biologist, uh, let's say that they would like to have 500 of those devices for, for, for the applications that you have shown in your thesis, which one would you select so that, so that you would be able to yourself make 500 of those? Is any of the devices at that level that it would work? Uh, if you would ask me, I would say I would go with uh, PDMS, mainly because uh, the, the throughput is a bit higher. Well, you could make, uh, in the method which I described, I could make, make uh, one or let's say 10 PMMA masks, uh, molds, then transfer them to PDMS, or I could make a SU8, for example. And with PDMS, you can just peel it, well, form it, so in case of a very large studies required, PDMS, I would say, is a, is a, a go-to choice, let's say. Um, and, and, and the method you think, <clears throat> think are at such level that you would be able to make 500 functional working devices? Well, it will take me a few, uh, <laughs> maybe some time, uh, but, uh, but I, I would assume that uh, re given reasonable time yeah. uh, with, P, uh, with uh, PDMS, at least you can make it. Uh, with PMMA as well, uh, if you if you... If, if you allow me to speculate, I would say that if we have enough cut masks, if we have enough surface area for DPV exposure, we could even do this with PMMA because it, it could be parallelized, right? Uh, if you so, little bit expand, uh, sorry, uh, I can move on, but if you little bit expand of thinking here, if you think all the all the devices, all, all chapters in your thesis, hmm. Hmm, chapter two, three with, with the cavities, would you still pick PDMS device if you, if there would be requests for, for, for those devices as well? Uh, no, so if you, well, you could do, so if you encompass everything, then I would say, for example, you could do milling, so micro milling. So in that case, I would pick, for example, polycarbonate device. Uh, you could, uh, for example, also it has been shown that um, FEP can, uh, you can use FEP for, for microstructuring, uh, but in larger channels, of course, not smaller channels. Uh, so. It depends on the dimensions which is required. So if it is a very small dimension, let's say uh, in a micrometer range, I would go with PMMA or poly uh, PDMS. If it's a slightly larger dimension, uh, then I would go with micro milling, for example, then polycarbonate or PMMA. Uh, so yeah, so then it would depend on the, di on the dimensions required, on the purpose required as well. Uh, so for example, if, if a more controlled environment is required. I will go with thermoplastics, especially inert thermoplastics. Mm -hmm. uh, if, yeah, so it depends on the purpose you wish. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm satisfied with, uh, with my questions at this point, and I will hand over back to the pro director. Yes, thank you. Um, and I turn to another guest. Um, well, officially not from so far, but now at present, of course, uh, remote anyway in Athens, but. Dr. Ioannis Papantoniou is an associate professor of tissue engineering at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, be welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Prodector, for the introduction. Uh, hello, Pinak. Congratulations to you, thank you. Uh, for a nice manuscript of a, of a thesis that you circulated and seen already. Also, congratulations for your nice presentation. And also congratulations to both of your supervisors uh, for, for, for uh, guiding you through this exciting project. So um, my first question will focus a little bit on uh, the early chapters that you presented. So the introduction I liked very much, one of the best introductions I've seen, to be honest, in, 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 in the thesis. Uh, it was very much my liking, uh, merging biologies and microengineering technologies. So. Uh, following that nice introduction, my question would be, okay, you see that with different microwell geometries, you can uh, impact the way that initially spheroidal shape uh, cellular aggregates can uh, undergo certain morphogenetic events. So what does geometry induce to the cells to have these distinct behaviors? What are the cues that are generated because of that? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, dear esteemed uh, opponent, for the question and for the kind remarks. Um, so, in case of 3D, uh, so I assume this is only in case, uh, let's assume this is in case of 3D aggregates uh, within the micro cavities. Now, it has been shown before uh, that, uh, for example, there are, there are multiple factors. So, one of them could be, for example, physical factor. One of them is, uh, for example, uh, the secretive factor, so paracrine factors. So, I'll start with the physical factors. Uh, now, it has been shown that if you use a uh, reporter's cell line for bracuri and you have a, a micro cavity, uh, uh, the position where the, the aggregate actually touches the micro cavity is more polarized than the other. So this physical contact actually leads to activation of certain genes within the aggregate. And this also happens in actually uh, developing embryos. So if you have an embryo and you constrain it in PDMS, it leads to a better or more closely mimicking embryonic development. Uh, there is also paracrine factors. So depending on the shape and size of the cavity, the aggregate could secrete factors, which then uh, induce signaling within itself and within the other uh, aggregates as well. So according to your opinion, it's a, a matter of how uh, secreted factors are distributed within the channels, therefore guiding morphogenesis, right? So it's a little bit uh, how the diffusion is functioning of these small molecules in different geometries. Uh, both diffusions and I would say also um, the well the physical factor as well uh, because uh, yeah sorry so would you think it's a mecha mechanical cues also related like was due to a higher osmotic phenomenon or something like that pressures etc or not um, osmotic well I would uh, probably go with just co contact so for example if if you have an aggregate and if it touches uh, or let's say touches a micro cavity uh, it could be that this this touching could, for example, activate certain genes in this peripheral part of the aggregate. And this leads to, for example, activation of downstream genes, for example. But this has been shown actually in uh, aggregates which were homogeneous, and then they were made to touch the PDMS the micro uh, cavities. And when they touch it, it leads to activation of bracteria in the, the part which touches the, the micro cavity. So basically, the proportion of the aggregate touching, let's say, the surface according to the geometry will be varies. It, it will definitely vary. Yeah. You could see this with your microscopy then, the pipeline that you develop. In this case, we could not see any Go variation ahead. in this. Uh, okay. We assume this is because in our case, the aggregates were relatively, uh, well, they're floating, of course, free floating. Uh, and uh, yeah, but we couldn't see, maybe if we, if we fitted live cell microscopy with, let's say, Bracuri or one of the genes involved, then we could have seen a difference. But Okay, Th thank you, Upinak. Another question, uh, a little bit following on this, is uh, do you think this device could be used for other cellular systems that are undergoing morphogenesis, for example? Would it be yes. gen generic technology to be applied? Yes, uh, so of course we would have to adapt the shape and size of the, of the micro cavities, uh, but it could be used for others. In fact, uh, we have shown, or uh, currently we are doing work in our lab uh, where we are using epiblast model, which is used in the, within these micro cavities. We are also trying to form uh, the blastoid model, which is another embryonic model. So the, the technique is a bit generic, so, but it could be applied to different, uh, let's say, organoid models or uh, embryonic development models, depending on, uh, on the need. Okay. Now, again, on the same topic, I have captivated yeah, a lot yeah. my, my imagination here. So, so, you know, on some of your results that you showed and were also in your paper in advanced material. So you, you, you showed some aggregates that had a nice elongated shape and was quite, quite symmetric, let's say, to the y-axis. In some cases, you had some, let's say, uh, aberrations in terms of geometry. They were more curled or, or, you know, there were more cells on one side than the other. What do you think might have caused this distinct, let's say, uh, is, it, is it biology or is it topography or because of experiments, some irregularities, or, or is, it, is there a fundamental explanation or is it more like, you know, error in the experiment? What do you think? Um, there, are, there are two things I would consider. So one is, of course, experimental. Uh, you would imagine that uh, most of the, for example, fluorescent images which you see are, uh, in this case, we have to harvest the aggregates. Now, during harvesting, you have to push uh, okay. the pipette up and down. And that causes the aggregates to, so, and the other could also be, for example, biological. So let's say um, these aggregates work quite reproducibly, but 
in certain cases, also this happens in, in vivo, for example, that some aggregates do not really elongate as well, or maybe there are some aggregates which have these cells outside. So there will be some cases there, uh, but in general, they follow this common theme. Yeah, so it's a combination of... So now using the machine learning technologies and the microscopy pipeline you developed in the next chapter, do you think you could go back and use it in order to predict how your morphogenesis could happen early on? Is it like, would it, you know, could you maybe, you know, for rapid uh, experiments yeah. uh, to forecast how, you know, this geometry with this uh, growth or breakage of symmetry, I will see in two days that morphology, you know, and verify it. Would this be something interesting? Yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting uh, this thing, uh, this Nick thought, because uh, using the power of machine learning and uh, automated feature extraction is that you can generate, let's say, a you could say a blueprint, right? Uh, of sorry, uh, you could generate a blueprint of a particular uh, time point. And what you could do is then image the same aggregate over time, and you could do it over multiple aggregate and by aggregates, uh, high throughput. And then you could go back retrospectively and say, okay, well, when I had this blueprint, this led to let's say this circularity and uh, this gene expression in the beginning led to this form. And so you could create a model where you actually have. Uh, initial part and you could put the image into the the computer and then the computer would predict i would say reasonably how the how the result would be mm. okay thank you and i have a last one yes. so you showed okay also another way of inducing let's say morphogenesis would be through uh, opposing morphogens like with the wind yes. with yes. inhibitor that you showed uh, and forming some gradients um, now if you wanted to couple you know, gradients of morphogens and different shapes of microwells. Whilst one is affecting the other, how would you see these two synergizing or, you know, uh, making maybe even more complex environments? Yes, uh, so one of the ways which this could be done, and uh, that is also, uh, I would say, the power of the technique of thermoforming. Uh, of course, uh, other techniques also have this, but in thermoforming, what you could do is you could create porous membranes with elongated cavities of different dimensions, let's say. In the uh, you could have a control where you do not flow anything, but in a, in a microfluidic chip, you could have a source and a sink, and through these porous microcavities, you could diffuse factors into the, into the aggregate. And so then you could see without any flow how the aggregate behaves, and with flow, how you could influence that. For example, maybe uh, without flow, the, the polarization of the aggregate is random. It could happen on the light, left or the right, uh, but with the flow of uh, morphogen on one side and the antagonist on the other, you could induce always same side uh, polarity within within the, the micro, micro cavity. Yeah. Okay, Pinak, thank you very much for your uh, answers. Uh, I you. pass the floor to the next, uh, to the prorector. Thank you very much for your contribution. I now turn to another member of the assessment committee, and that's Professor Habibovic. She's a professor of inorganic biomaterials at Merlin in our university. Pamela, please, your question. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. The candidate, uh, also, I would like to congratulate you on finalizing your thesis, uh, to congratulate your supervisor uh, and us as an institute, because I think you have really delivered a very nice piece of work. Thank you. Um, I would like to, um, you know, what I liked about your thesis is that it has a very much an engineering vibe to it. Not only the, uh, uh, the images are beautiful, the illustrations are very um, illustrative, um, but also it is very concise, it's very to the point. So uh, you are explaining everything, but not giving it a word too much. So I think that is uh, worth a compliment because it's very pleasant to read. Okay. Um, to, to start the discussion, I would actually like you, normally we ask your uh, paranyms to do this, but I would actually like you now uh, to, to read two of the statements that you have provided together with your thesis. And these are statements number six and number eight. Uh, statements, uh, you mean uh, the... Yeah, the propositions. The propositions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, dear uh, <laughs> has team director. The propositions are with my paranyms, uh, so I do not have them on me right now. Shall I then I read them for, for yes, you? Please. Okay. Yes. I apologize. Now at least you, you now realize why you thanked the committee beforehand, right? 
So uh, the st- uh, yeah, the proposition number six says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And that's by Richard Feynman. And, as, uh, and uh, number eight says, manufacturing is so hard. I have the utmost respect for those who build things by Elon Musk. And what I would like to, to ask you, so because you put two propositions that are very similar to, to one another, I, I assume that this is important for you. Uh, so uh, I, what I would like to ask you is to which extent do you think that the ability to manufacture or make something actually is important for the advancement of science? Yes, uh, dear uh, highly esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for uh, the question and also for reading out the, the proposition. Um, well, I would assume uh, when I st- as you were seeing this thesis, we constantly had to develop new tools and manufacture uh, new techniques. Uh, and also products, which we could use for, for example, application. Uh, now, I would think that uh, with new and new biological models coming up uh, and new and new, let's say, findings in biology, you would need new tools, which could, for example, help us understand this biological phenomena. But at the same time, these new tools should be accessible. They should be easy to use and they should generate valid results or they should res- generate results in the hands of, let's say, the people who use the models. Uh, so in this case, we need to manufacture this, but also make sure that these manufactured tools are applicable wherever. Uh... I will come back to that second part of your statement, but I would like to go back to the first one where you say, yeah, we, we should be able to manufacture them. But as you, you probably know yourself, thinking of an idea uh, is much faster than actually manufacturing something in a lab. I'm pretty sure that with, with four platforms that you've developed, you've experienced that. My question was really, to which extent does it advance the science, the, the, the state of the art in a science? And do you, don't you think that uh, trying to make something, to really make something also kind of delays the progress in a scientific creativity, if you wish? Yes, um, it's an inter- interesting question because uh, yeah, I can understand on the one hand, if you, you could use exist, pre-existing techniques, of course, uh, and you could try to adapt them, let's say, uh, to these processes. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes it is necessary to create new techniques and new methods. Uh, for example, in the first chapter, let's say we used uh, normal uh, microscopy or normal life cell microscopy with a spinning disk on focal. Now, usually such microscopes are not used for intensive 3D life cell tracking, especially in multi-micrometer aggregates. Had we not used the method, we could have, for example, gone with another method of uh, putting an aggregate within a hydrogel, then embedding it, and then measuring it using light sheet or other. But that would also require significant investment of time because you don't know how the aggregate behaves in the biological system. So it's a balance. And I would assume that material-oriented uh, let's say engineering is a bit more, I would not say it easy, but I would say that it's a bit, a bit quicker than trying to optimize a, a biological system. Uh, okay. Okay, clear. Then I would like to, to come back to the second part where you, because that is something that you highlight uh, at different uh, points in your thesis, the importance of um, uh, easy uh, access, um, a low cost, um, you know, easy to use and so on. What I was wondering is whether that does not compromise um, the, the quality and the, um, also the applicability, the range of applicability of the platforms that you've developed. So did you compromise uh, anything in order to make them easily accessible or, or, or inexpensive? Uh, yeah, that is interesting. So we could have used indeed, so for almost all the, the techniques or all the new softwares, plugins, methods we developed, which were free and open source, there were alternatives which we could have used. For example, for uh, cell tracking, we could have an- used another software. Now, firstly, uh, there are two reasons for this. So one of them is more professional and scientific, is that if you, if you develop a um, software pipeline with using already existing software, the good thing is that this can be uh, easily shared with others. So other people who work in the, let's say, the same morphogenetic model, they can just download the software. They don't have to buy a separate version of it they can produce data using exactly the same method and it can be comparative, mm-hmm. uh, which leads to further advancement of the field. Now, uh, of course, the, the other thing is also a bit uh, more personal because uh, let's say you are setting up a lab uh, 
you would like to of course see where where you could let's say not have to spend too much time too much effort to get a software into your lab and instead use free open uh, open source uh, okay. so so yeah, yeah. there are two aspects of Excellent. Okay, clear. Now I would like to 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 have I have a more content uh, question um, that kind of builds on a number of previous questions by the previous opponents, but it's a more specific, and this relates to my own research because, as you probably know, I, I really like the use of um, I I like micro technological microfluidic tools to to be used in. Um, in regenerative medicine, but but my 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 kind of my expertise is in, in in bone regeneration. Now, considering everything that you have learned from the thesis, what you have developed so far, imagine that you would together with me like to uh, develop uh, a non yet existing uh, model, in vitro model, a physiological like model of of regeneration of bone tissue. Uh, can you mention uh, what are the potential and uh, what is the potential use of the tools you've developed and what is the biggest challenge that you see with these tools if you would develop such and i really mean a comprehensive model starting from inflammation to a remodeling of bone okay yeah uh, thank you uh, for the question uh, so now this is a multifaceted question of course uh, you would first so there are three or four parts which i can already think of so one would be the cell part so such a model, uh, you would need to know the different pathways, of course, which are involved and different activators. Uh, let's say you start with embryonic stem cell, differentiate it into mesenchyme, then differentiate it into, let's say, mesenchymal stem cells and bone. So that first part needs to be there, but more or less uh, studies have been done on, uh, let's say, how to decipher this. Uh, the second part would be materials. So you could choose between different materials to fabricate and then different designs as well. Uh, so what you could do is, for example, have a normal traditional source and sink model, or you could have a Christmas tree model, which I already mentioned, of different gradients. And uh, or you could use a 3D model. So I think uh, recently a bone organoid model has been published as well. Uh, and then just use the, the model. Uh, now, you, could, you would want to, for example, see, okay, how do the cells move and uh, which cells form the bone? And how does this process take place? So you could generate reporter lines. You could use the tracking tools using this thin film cavities to see how the cells move or do they move before differentiating and producing bone. Alternatively, what you could do is uh, do this uh, automated feature extraction where you could actually start with a group of cells and then see, okay, which one of these is more efficiently forming, let's say, bone. You could put factors in and then extract the data and say, okay, these factors are the ones which influence. And then you could put finally these things in a microfluidic chip and then have these factors in a more dynamic condition as you would expect in the body to better mimic, let's say, physiological conditions. But thank you, very, uh, very nice ideas. With that, uh, I would like to, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with your answers and I would like to give the word back to ProRector. Who sees a new collaboration coming, uh, coming up, I think. I now turn to the next opponent, it's Dr. Florian Clément, and he's uh, an assistant professor of toxicology genomics in our university. Dear candidate, uh, I would like also to congratulate you on your thesis. I was not in the, in the assessment committee, so I, I studied deeply your thesis, um, which was very interesting. I would say even enlightening, gave me a lot of ideas for future grants. And so it, it was very interesting. And also yeah. for your presentation. Uh, and I, I find here the, the limit of paper thesis. Uh, we missed the video and, and, and I guess that's something to think about for the future. So I would like to um, focus my, um, uh, my opposition on uh, the aspect of all your platform that you uh, mentioned several times in different chapter, which is the drug testing aspect of uh, so using your platform to test drugs. Yeah. I would start on details and zoom out for, uh, during my opposition. So I would like to start on, on, fig on figure six of chapter two, to be precise, um, page 62. Yeah. Uh, so, so here you, you, you test uh, a drug, uh, latroculin A, Yes. at different doses. Uh, and uh, looking at, at figure six here, I was wondering first, why do you have a different number of aggregates for the different dose being nine and six, uh, so, which is kind of you know, not even first and, and not that much, comp especially if we compare to the top of the, the figure where you have 11 aggregates without the drug. Yes, uh, dear esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your questions and for the kind remark. Uh, now, uh, the way these uh, this screenings were performed, 
was that you uh, go to the well you put the plate in the microscopy uh, you start of course with the same number of, of wells or aggregates and you put the well uh, you put them in a, in the microscope but when you start the imaging you have to because as you can imagine um, a 3d high content imaging takes up a lot of space so in fact uh, this data was in the terabytes of space and you would have to then limit the number of uh, number of aggregates you image so first we didn't even know if this would work in let's say our control samples which has never been shown at all so we first took the highest number of control samples possible then we started to okay we started to take a lower number of samples for the for the drug induced and we, there we were also limited because uh, the stage it moves around uh, during imaging and uh, the speed which we set was 500 micrometer per second which is extremely low and uh, each image stack already takes time so this was the maximum number of imaging aggregates which we could fit in one go let's say okay uh, so we had to distribute it like this uh, okay i understand but so is the fact that you have less aggregate in uh, the highest dose that could lead to some kind of toxicity where you drop the number of aggregates uh, over time or is it unrelated? Uh, so we did not in this case um, uh, exclude any any aggregates, of course. Okay. Uh, but uh, as you can see also some, so aggregate one, for example, is still showing even higher, let's say, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But uh, in, in theory, if, if we were to do it, let's say, completely in detail, and if I was to study the effect of Latin clean A, what I would do is actually have indeed similar number of aggregates, have higher number of aggregates, uh, and then do this study using, for example, let's say a high throughput and high content method, where I could test, uh, let's say, speculating 100 aggregates for one each sample. Okay. Uh, this would, of course, require optimization of the microscope, so we would need higher speed and higher um, Z speed as well and XY speed, uh, but that could be uh, that could be the next step. So this was a proof of concept just to show that okay there is a difference we see a difference, uh, but to have a more statistically reliable and robust uh, data we would need higher sample size and equal sample size. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I agree. Then. So uh, another important topic for us toxicologists is the solvent. I, I did not find any solvent use uh, for for these drugs, so I would assume you just dilute that in the medium. Uh, but in, in toxicology, one of the main problem is to make sure that the compound or the drug that you test enter the cells. Uh, and for that main, most of the time we use a solvent like ethanol yeah. or even more DMSO. You know? and, and as you may know, the problem of DMSO is, is that it, it could it could interact, I guess, with the, the, yeah. the, the platform. So I, I was wondering, do you think, and, and do, this could be a more generic question for the four different material platforms that you use in your thesis. Uh, do, are they all compatible with DMSO, or do you think that some of them could, you know, even pass through DMSO could pass through the membrane, for instance? Yes. Uh, so thank you again for the question. Uh, so a majority of the compounds which I use were actually dissolved in uh, DMSO. Okay. So that makes your question highly relevant as well. Okay. So I think most of the compounds which I use were dissolved as per the manufacturer's guidelines, So that, which is usually entails DMSO. And also in chapter two, we use 1% uh, DMSO for, uh, for, cardiac for the differentiation of the aggregate. Now, there have been multiple papers before which show the effect of uh, DMSO on, on cells. Uh, it is usually considered, or it was considered inert, but recently there have been uh, papers where, for example, mouse embryonic stem cells, and it has different effect on different cells, of course. So mouse embryonic stem cells with DMSO, they return to repotency. Human embryonic stem cells, they undergo differentiation. Uh, for example, when DMSO was tested in, uh, or even low concentration of 0.1% was tested in cardiac and hepatic uh, organoids or micro tissues, they showed variety of epigenetic proteomic changes. So there have been studies, of course. Now, um, but however, DMSO is still the widely used solvent. Uh, and the, way, the reason we use this, it showed relatively low phototoxicity, uh, but it could induce changes. Now, the question would be whether these changes with the, the growth factor can be demarcated or not. And in this case, yes. However, they, we cannot rule out the, uh, any other changes which were caused due to DMS. So for example, there could be definitely epigenetic changes or changes in gene expression. Uh, however, till the time robust controls are taken, we believe that uh, we can account for it. But 
there is need for, for better chemicals which do not cause these changes. Regarding your question about materials, uh, so for example, uh, some of the materials used in this study, let's say FEP, it is highly inert and I would not expect it to interact uh, with DMSO. As much as, for example, let's say some other chemicals, for example, polystyrene, which was used in the last chapter, DMSO actually dissolves polystyrene. So if I were to use a high concentration of, or even a low concentration, it could happen that the DMSO interacts with polystyrene, some factors leach out and those affect the cells then. So these factors also have to be considered. Uh, so that's why, for example, if in case a higher concentration of DMSO is required, something like FEP could be used, which is relatively inert to DMSO. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I have the time for the last questions because it's just 11. So maybe Pro Rector. Oh, I well, we, we will have to wait for the beetle anyway, so okay. maybe very, so, very so, so maybe a, a short last one. So you, you mentioned uh, indeed drug platform uh, as uh, for chapter uh, th two and three, but not for chapter uh, four and five. So I was wondering if this uh, deep UV treatment could interfere, uh, and, and, and notably in chapter four, you mentioned a toxic developer, I believe, uh, a developer known to have toxic uh, byproduct. Yes. So, uh, would you think that deep uh, ultraviolet treatment is compatible with drug testing or would you avoid it? No, I would think it is compatible with uh, drug testing. And uh, the reason is that uh, so we use, of course, thermoplastics, which are relatively, let's say, uh, I would not call them stable, but they can work with, uh, for drug testing. They've been used before. And secondly, we could use, for example, the gradients of, of drugs. So I'll just just continue that, okay. But I, I think that even though we use the textbook developer. But please finish your answer short. Okay, uh, so even though we use toxic developers, uh, this could be substituted with something like IPA and water, which has also been used for, for uh, developing purpose. And uh, this could be used, for example, as a microfluidic chip where you test different gradients of molecules. So th it is definitely possible then. Okay, thank you for your answer then, and I give the floor to the collector. Yes, thank you. Because Mr. Samal, uh, the time for defending the thesis has now passed. Uh, the degree committee will withdraw to discuss the quality of the thesis and of course also the quality of your defense. And I uh, would assume that you and your company await the results of our deliberations uh, here online and then will return in a couple of minutes and thereby I adjourn.
please unmute your proctor. Yeah, I was automatically muted. Mr. Samal, the Dubi Committee, we gradually present online, has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense, and in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the Dubi Committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Tuchen Müller is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom, so invite, I invite your supervisor to take the floor. Thank you, Professor. Dear candidate, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Pinak Samal, cum laude, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university, shown by the beadle. Thank you. Thank you. Please carry on, uh, Roman. I can carry on then with a, a laudation. Thank you. Dear Dr. Samal, dear Pinak, knowing you now since 2013 from old times at University of Twente as a student uh, in my biomedical materials engineering course, where you have been the old time best scoring student, it is a pleasure for me to experience, to live with you through this special moment and congratulate you to your more than deserved and obviously cum laude awarded doctoral promotion. I will keep my laudation short also as my natural role in the supervisor team was limited to that of a co-advisor in microtechnological matters, which I was more than happy to fulfill. I was also happy that you integrated in your research and developed further technologies of Stefan and me from our joint times at Calcio Institute of Technology. This was finally evidenced by higher amounts of tissue culture plastic where yellowed due to photolytic degradation as a consequence of long-term UV irradiation and to be found in many drawers in our Merlin Micro Nano Lab. I personally was always intrigued by researchers whose work directly beneficial translates into society, such as in our discipline into the health or recovery of patients. Regarding your research and thesis work, it has the potential to considerably ease the life of many biomedical researchers, for example, of those who want to employ advanced technology towards higher level essays and readouts by creating designer topographical microenvironments in their culture dishes, for example. I'm glad that you continue to join our labs now as a postdoctoral researcher in Stefan's team, which I'm convinced will be fruitful both for you and for the Merlin family. Congratulations again and enjoy the success. I would like to thank the defense chair, the members of the assessment and the defense committee, the consulted external experts for the time they invested reading the thesis, writing the reports and designing the questions respectively. I would also like to extend my congratulations to your family and friends. And with this, I would like to hand over to Stefan as the daily supervisor of this excellent thesis project for his laudation. Thank you, Roman. The torch was meanwhile kept going slowly but steadily and after a time passed the place where the hare was sleeping, but the hare slept on very peacefully 
And when at last he did wake up, the tortoise was near the goal. The hare ran now, now ran his swiftest, but he could not overtake the tortoise in time. Slow and steady wins the race. So this is the morale of, the fa of this famous fable, the tortoise and the hare. So you may wonder why I'm citing the end of this fable. Well, there's a, a very simple explanation for this. Over the years, it be has become a habit or even a ritual that whenever I met Pinoch in the office or in the lab or even in the Albert Hein, close to the places where we both live, for example, at 8.30 in, on a Saturday morning, um, and, and I asked him about how things are going, then he always replied with the same standard phrase, slow and steady. In a way, although it might also be a bit misleading, misleading in a sense that it could potentially conjure up in an image, an image of a slow worker, this phrase still nicely and accurately describes Pinak's friendly and very humble character, his ambitions, and for sure his outstanding work attitude. Dear Dr. Zaman, dear Pinak, this day marks a very important moment in your life and also in your professional career, but it is also an important one in my life as I had the honor to be your daily supervisor in the last few years. Therefore, it is my pleasure to say a few words about you, your work and your journey from a highly motivated graduate to a very productive and focused scientist in the last years. I enjoyed a lot to be able to accompany you as a supervisor and co-driver, in the beginning, mainly in the role of trainer, teacher and supervisor, but in the end, more as a colleague and friend. Before I even met you in person, I already heard a couple of very promising stories from my colleague, as Owen just mentioned, and Owen, who at that time was collaborator at University 20 while I was still working in Germany. You were enrolled in some of his courses, and according to Owen, you have been always one of the top performers, if not the top performer, in those courses. When Owen and I then started hiring in Maastricht, it was clear for us that we, would, that we would need excellent candidates who, on the one hand, were able to actively help us to shape a new exciting research environment, and on the other hand, were able to prove Maastricht University and the rest of the world how well the new Institute Merlin would already perform right after they start. In 2014, when Roman invited me to join the farewell party of the people who moved from University 20 to Maastricht, this was actually the first time when I met you, Pinak, in person. I still remember that we spent quite some time during this party to discuss potential topics for a PhD thesis at UM. And I soon realized that you had very similar interests and ideas than what I had in mind for my own career at UM, and that our research goals were pretty much aligned um, already at that time. We talked about stem cells and stem cell-based models and how we could use them to study morphogenesis and organogenesis in vitro, but also how microengineering would still play an essential role in this. If I remember correctly, it took not too long that Oma and I and you came to the conclusion that it would be actually a good idea to start to work together and you agreed to come to us for an hour. Unfortunately, the first years at UM were different from what we have imagined as the construction of the labs and here in particular, the clean room lab took much longer than expected. So we needed to come up with many alternative solutions and workarounds. And I think this is also an important part of your PhD thesis. This first phase was for sure tough, but it also turned out that Pinak, you uh, are not only a hard worker, but that you are also a very creative mind with a lot of patience and endurance who can cope actually with such challenging situations. And although the situation of ongoing lab constructions and limited lab access lasts much longer than anticipated, you never really complain about it or took this as an opportunity to work less or to try to lower the expectation. Instead, you decided to work even harder to reach your goals, which is one of your outstanding traits, which proves your quality as a formidable colleague and scientist, and what also clearly distinguished you as a calm, polite, and very humble person with an always po positive attitude. Pinak always enters the lab with a friendly smile, for instance, which is one of the many reasons why I always enjoyed it so much to work together with him. Unfortunately, the bumpy start with our lab constructions was not, was not the only obstacle during your PhD. The famous cyber attack, and finally the pandemic made it quite challenging for you to keep up to your so-called slow and steady progress. And there was another major setback during your thesis when one of our collaborator, collaborators surprisingly and suddenly without any warning pulled the plug and abandoned our joint project. This had quite an impact and frustrated both of us. And at that time, I was actually really worried that you will lose your unshakable faith and unconditional dedication to science, which is for sure another one of your strong points. But I guess we got through this together and well, Pinag, you luckily kept your positive and thoughtful attitude and managed to stay on track with your slow and steady progress. And in the end, it for sure helped um, that uh, you got some additional support from another family member. Uh, so Chase Amal, 
uh, your brother who also joined our teams and, and the Samal brothers became a quiet and yet efficient double impact at the Marilyn Institute. So the point I want to make here is that despite all these circumstances, in your quiet, humble, and self-critical way, you managed to develop really innovative techniques in the field of 3D cell culture platforms, which will pave the ground for new approaches in the field of cell biology and regenerative medicine. You produce impressive results in this interdisciplinary field that were able to publish your manuscript in leading high-impact journals. You filed a patent, actually this just happens today, uh, and you publish more manuscripts on innovative in vitro tools in the coming weeks in excellent journals. Pinak always impressed me by how structured and organized he is. A good, but maybe also not an ideal example for this is the storing of samples. I think Roman also touched on that. Although we're not meant to store many samples at Merlin because of the restricted space that we have, he was always able to find more drawers and boxes in various labs to store his samples. And honestly, I'm a bit worried that in case he would leave Merlin one day, we'll probably still find more and more hidden stashes of samples, molds, and tools, even after many years. However, in a way, this always made me feel confident and confirmed my personal impression that PNAC has a very high level of problem solving competence, which is the highest level of competences and for sure one of the most important competences of a full grown scientist. PNAC, during your PhD, you have proven that slow and steady wins the race is more than just a saying, as you're winning your personal race today, but you have also proven that it takes more than just hard working to successfully finish a PhD, because you can, of course, also steadily move in the, in the wrong direction. So you have also proven and impressively shown that a raw ability to make deliberate progress in a meaningful direction is needed. And then you have proven that once, that, and you have proven more than once that you are able to sprint whenever it is necessary. I would like to congratulate to your outstanding achievements, to your successful PhD. Uh, and I'm grateful that I could be part of your race. It was a pleasure to work with you and see you grow and to become a fully fledged scientist. I'm looking forward to continue to work with you in the future. Finally, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the assessment and the defense committee for taking the time to go through the thesis and for being here with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dear Dr. Samal, also on behalf of the Board of Deans and the whole academic community here in Maastricht, I would like to congratulate you. I hope you did see that the uh, footer under your Zoom image has now changed which is thanks to our technical support. Uh, and I well, uh, also want to express that the cum laude honor is really exceptional uh, and well-deserved as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it only happens to about three or 4% of our candidates. So, uh, so uh, be, be convinced that this is really uh, an honor to you as well. I'd like to extend the congratulations to the both, both the supervisors, so Dr. Gieselbeck and uh, Professor Tuttenmuller but also to the Merlin Institute and the whole community over there. I saw your acknowledgements and there are so many people uh, from the Merlin Institute that are thanked there that I must say, this is not only intellectually, but probably also socially home to you. So we might all be happy that you will remain there for quite a while. Um, as all already said, I would like to thank the opponents of today and the members of the assessment committee, and especially of course, the guests from abroad Professor Calio and Dr. Papantoniu. Uh, Papantoniu, it's, it remains difficult for a Dutchman, but still. Um, and um, thereby, I would like to conclude this session. Um, this session is closed.